Hi guys! Today I'm going to show you how I work on a painting that belongs to the series that is very important to me. I love painting glowing hands and that's the most popular theme of mine. And for some reason I was always so nervous and concentrated on the process that I've never been able to film it, even though I've created a lot of similar paintings. So this painting is one of the first. And I really hope that you will like this demonstration. In this video I will discuss a few topics. The first one will be references and the second my favorite colors. And in between the themes I'll be talking about what I do and why. I've added marks to the video so you can click on the part that interests you the most or you can watch the whole video. So let's begin. Usually it all starts with a sketch. This painting is one of the two that were done for the Small Works show in Baynard Gallery in Melbourne, Australia. My plan was to create two small square paintings of hands. This one is called Touch. You can see that the first layer here is pretty thick. I don't paint it transparent, but rather take a lot of paint and try to make it as close to the final painting as possible but at the same time I'm keeping it pretty quick and sloppy. No details, only big areas and relationships. The idea is to keep this layer pretty thin, enough so it won't take ages for it to dry. Usually I do the first layer, wait around a week for it to dry and come back to paint on top. The first layer that I've created here is only to give me guidance. In fact, I always cover it with the paint on the second layer, because it's really hard to mix wet paint with the dry surface and create a smooth transition. It's so much easier to just mix the same colors and add it on top. My first layer is sloppy anyway, so I don't really need it to be seen. Here you can see the moment when I came back for the second layer. I've kept the red color not very straight on purpose. Now I have room to add more intense colors and make this area pop a bit more. And it's perfect time to talk about paint colors that I use for my glowing hands. Most of my paints represent Zorn Limited palette. It's the palette that was invented by an incredible Swedish artist. I've talked about why I stick to it in my How I Learned to Paint with video. The primary reason is that I needed to limit my choices, because I was too overwhelmed by different tints and hues and endless possibilities. After a few years of using only this limited palette, I've started adding different paint colors to it. And here are the colors that are on my glowing hands palette now. My basic palette is titanium white, yellow ochre, cadmium red medium and ivory black. These are the colors that I use in every painting that I create. I've also added burnt amber as my brown option. It can be time consuming to mix a perfect brown out of ivory black, red and yellow. So at one point I just included the burnt amber to my palette. This is the base that I use in each and every painting that I create. It's very universal, however, it's limiting. And the problem with glowing hands is that to create that intense glowing, you need loud saturated colors, while cadmium red and yellow ochre are very calm ones, and they can create that contrast. So I had to add something else to my palette, and through trial and errors I've picked a few colors. I need a perfect red, and right now my favorite choice is permanent red light. It's a warm saturated red that leans towards orange. 
which creates a nice contrast with cool colors that I pick for the areas around the glow. My favorite choice for yellows stays the same for years. It's two colors. The first one is permanent yellow medium. By the look of this tube, you can see that I've been using it a lot. And the second one is permanent lemon yellow. By the way, this is a fresh tube, because the previous one was over. The difference between them is temperature. The yellow medium is a warm one, while the lemon one is, well, has a lemon color, a cooler lighter version of the yellow medium. And the three colors create a transition to light. It starts with red, then proceeds to pink or orange, then it turns into yellow medium, and finally to a combination of white and lemon yellow. This is the gradient that I usually use. This was a brief explanation of my color tubes choices. This month on my Patreon I will post a detailed video where I'll be talking about paints that I use, colors and how to pick them. Let's come back to the beginning of the process and talk a bit more about sketches and references. I usually start with some kind of a compositional sketch. And if you think that it's a beautiful one, you are completely wrong. Here it is. The idea of it is to capture the movement and see how it's supposed to look on this shape of canvas. And to be honest, this one is one of the most good looking ones, because usually they look like a complete mess. And no one except me can understand what is happening there. When the sketch is done, it's time to take references. And in most cases, I use myself as a model. Firstly, because I'm available for myself anytime. And I don't need to plan the shooting ahead. Secondly, I'm always afraid to ask someone else to pose for me. The more I work, the less is the fear, but anyway, it's still with me. So on this painting, the upper hand is mine while the lower one is my husband's. I use him as a model a lot. Here you can see the comparison between the reference that I took and the finished painting. In one of the recent Instagram posts, I've mentioned how important creating own references is for an artist. When you work from someone else's photograph, no matter how far you will go from it, the base will always be someone else's creation. You're not the one who worked with model, angle, light, and so on. It was picked by a different person. And I think that sometimes it limits the creativity and vision of an artist. Because knowing how to work with light, how to achieve the look that you need, is very important. It always comes with practice, so if you don't take your references, it will be hard to start doing that when you'll need them. And if you want to be a professional artist, you will have to learn how to do that. Because it's not great to depend on someone else's work. I don't want to say that you shouldn't use photos that you found on Pinterest or somewhere else. I just want to encourage you to analyze what makes them appealing to you. And how you can produce something similar for your future projects. You can see that on the reference there wasn't any glow light. This effect is called subsurface scattering, and the Wikipedia says that it's when the light penetrates the surface and be reflected by a number of times at irregular angles inside the material before passing back out of the material at a different angle than it would have had if it had been reflected directly off the surface. Sounds a bit too wordy, but it means that the object is not very thick and can pass the light. However, it's not completely transparent, so the light reflects inside and creates this type of glow. This effect is widely used by 3D artists to create realistic objects. And I highly recommend checking subsurface scattering in Google Images, because there are plenty of amazing before and after results. At first, I was doing references with the light behind my hand to create this glow. And usually the final painting was a compilation of a lot of different references. Because it was impossible to create a perfect light the way I imagined it from the first try. 
So after lots of studies, it turned out that it was easier to create this effect from my imagination rather than from the reference. If you are interested in my approach to create this type of light, don't forget to mention that in the comment section. And I'll be happy to create a video dedicated to that. And don't hesitate to ask me questions. Sometimes when I add voice to these videos, I stuck with themes and ideas to discuss. I have a routine and it's so permanent and usual for me that it can be hard to understand what a person that doesn't live in my head wants to know. Most of the time I'm sitting in my studio working and not talking to anyone, so I'll be happy to answer any kind of question that will appear in your head. And I'm always open for discussion. I think that I went a bit too far from the topic that we were discussing in this video. But anyways, I wanted to mention that because I've been asked where I find my references a lot. And the answer is, in most cases, I take them myself. So let's come back to what is happening on the screen. The process that I show here is common for all of my artworks. I start with an outline, then proceed to a rough first layer. And then goes the second layer, that is usually the main one. And the third layer is for some adjustments. Usually nothing really changes at that point. If you want to see a more detailed video where I show the full process, you can find it on my Patreon. There I post time lapses, tutorials and behind the scenes. The link will be in the description. You can see that I'm trying to work on small areas. It happens because this way I'll keep the paint wet and it will mix easily. If you want to blend in smoothly, you need to have enough paint on the canvas. And it's also important for the values to be close. It's almost impossible to mix smoothly if colors are too far from each other. So you need to be very thorough and accurate to blend colors together. And it's also important to pick right brushes. And here I'm talking not just only about from what they are made of and how soft they are, but also it's very important to select the right size of the brush for each area. The more details you want to have, the smaller the brush will be. I usually try to pick the biggest brush possible for the area that I'm working on. It helps to do more in less time. And when you work so thoroughly, it's already very time consuming. So if I can save some time by working with bigger brushes, I do that. Here you can see me working on the edge. It can be hard to create a smooth transition on areas like that. I pick a few colors in between the color of the background and the skin and add it to the canvas. The more the better. And just smooth the line between them. It works perfectly only if all colors are still wet. I always add the black color to the background as the last step. I don't use a mole stick like I supposed to do. And I'm pretty clumsy, so I always mess up everything around. 
That's why the background on bigger paintings is always the last step for me. And here you can see the result. This painting is already sold. I'm so happy that it found its forever loving home. However, soon it will become available as a print and in a set of postcards. They will be on my website, as well as other prints from Glowing Hands series. So don't forget to subscribe to my collector's list. No obligations involved, I'll just send you an email when they'll become available. This was a few seconds of self-promotion. Thank you so much for watching this video and listening to me. I hope that it was useful and interesting. Don't forget to click the like button, add a comment and share this video if you liked it. I have a very small channel, so everything counts. Thank you and I hope to see you soon.